Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we will be considering the uh, ASC 716 load combinations in both LRFD and ASD uh, procedures. In particular, we will be looking at the scenarios that each type of loading uh, combination represents, as well as how they handle service level loads versus design level loads, and how each of them uh, achieves safety and a, a degree of, oh, safety and reliability uh, when dealing with the kind of uncertainties in loads and performance that we explored in our previous lecture. Before looking at the actual load combinations, let's do a very brief rundown of the LRFD versus ASD design philosophies. So we have LRFD and ASD. So, and this will be important when we look at the uh, look at LRFD versus ASD later on, especially when we start seeing some factors associating with it, uh, associated with ASD, which at first seems a little confusing. So let's do a very brief review of the philosophy of each of these. With LRFD, you're going to be applying uh, separate factors to increase load. and decrease resistance. In other words, we're going to consider the loads to be larger than we are than our best estimates and we're going to consider our resistances, our strengths, capacities, etc to be uh, to be less than our best estimates. So, and again, as we discussed in our previous lecture, the idea of breaking them up into separate factors is that you can then tune them uh, using separate, uh, separate probability analyses and also considering separately the consequences of failure to achieve, uh, at least ideally, uh, the same uniform level of safety uh, across the entire structure for all load cases. Okay. ASD. ASD, of course, is the more traditional method. The uh, older method prior to uh, LRFD's adoption um, in starting in the 70s, 80s, and, and into the present more and more. Um, but anyway, ASD, allowable stress design, again, here you apply a single factor. You're going to apply a single factor to all loads or to loads. And this takes into account, this, this essentially manages risk for on both the load and the resistance side. One factor uh, for both load and resistance. And this will be important as we look, when we look at the uh, ASD load combinations. Also, let us consider the difference between service level loads and design level loads. We may have touched on this briefly previously, but I did want to just emphasize this very briefly um, because this will be critical in our following discussion. In case you're not familiar with the terms, uh, service level loads these represent loads before any factors are applied. Uh, loads without any factors applied in other words they represent our best estimate as uh, engineers uh, of the type of loading that will be experienced in a given event or a, cer a scenario based on a certain return period 50 year return period 2% on annual probability whatever you may be designing uh, your structure for so um, again these are the uh, these are the, the results you get when, for example, you say, okay, I want to design my structure for a 50-year storm. And then you go and calculate what kind of uh, wind event that represents, what kind of rain event that represents. And then you go and calculate um, all of the wind forces that that generates and the forces in members, etc. The service level loads are those simple best estimates without any kind of factors of safety or load factors applied. And our design loads... Well, these are the loads that are actually, of course, going to be used to design the structure. These are our factored loads. And often I'll use the term design loads and factored loads interchangeably. Uh, used to design structure. 
again, we get our factored or design loads after uh, per first performing our best estimates on how, uh, on what kind of loads we'll experience, what kind of environmental events we'll experience, what kind of uh, ultimate, uh, our best guess, uh, our best estimate, I should say, <coughs> loads that our uh, structures will experience for a given, um, a given probability return period, and then applying some amount of factor of safety if you're doing ASD, or applying uh, factored load combinations if you're doing LRFD. So with those terms out of the way, I think we can begin looking at our uh, LRFD load combinations. Shown here are the ASC 716 LRFD load combinations. Now, uh, note I'm including only some of the most basic load combinations. There are some more uh, advanced ones for more complicated situations, but the real purpose of this video is really just to illustrate how uh, the load uh, combinations are created to essentially uh, manage or uh, simulate different kinds of events that might be experienced over the life of a structure's uh, lifespan or service life. First, let us consider the first and perhaps simplest load case, 1.4 times D. This is 1.4 times the dead load applied to the structure. And obviously this is meant to represent a, a massive, uh, probably uh, underestimation in dead load or some case where the dead load ends up becoming uh, much larger than what we were, uh, than what the design engineers were estimating when designing a bit with a building or structure involved. And so notice also that this is the, the uh, when looking down at the various load combinations, this is the largest factor ever applied to dead load. And this, uh, this kind of begins to show us what the uh, ASC load combinations really start to do or, or are really designed to do. They're designed to apply different factors to consider different kinds of scenarios. And those are different extreme case scenarios that a building may ex uh, experience over its design lifetime. And this particular case is just one where um, there is a total dead load that is massively greater than what we were estimating as our best estimate. And it's hard to imagine what that scenario might actually look like, but you might be dealing with something like, oh, I don't know. And the real tricky part is it's dead load. It's not like um, it's not like live load, which you can imagine a building being stuffed to the gills with way more people than we were imagining. So it's hard to see how you'd end up with 1.4 times the dead load that you that you would uh, design for. But there are cases where you might do that. For example, if um, one thing that comes to mind is what about some sort of construction error? What if a building is you know designed for a slab uh, 12 inches thick and there's a miscommunication or something goes wrong? in the process from going from the uh, engineering calculations to the final drawings, or maybe the, they're inter misinterpreted in some way, and you end up with slabs that are 12 inches thick instead of 10 inches thick. Or, God forbid, you end up with a, uh, um, I don't know, there, there are many different kinds of errors that can, can, that can occur in the construction of a building. So when you see a 1.4 times D, you're talking about a massively larger dead load. Um, than you would otherwise uh, have uh, estimated when designing your structure. And uh, there, it's kind of tricky to figure out what kind of scenario might result in a 40% uh, greater dead load, but some I can think of involve construction errors or um, maybe some uh, unpermitted renovations or something down, down the road with that kind of thing. But anyway, our first scenario essentially represents a massively overestimated, or I should say a massively underestimated dead load, or a real dead load that ends up being at some point during the, during the building's uh, lifespan, however that may be, at some point that structure experiences a dead load much greater than what we estimate when we're designing our structure. Next, consider load case two. Uh, 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times live plus uh, 0.5 of uh, roof live load, snow load, or rain load. So what does this represent? Well, notice from uh, at right at the start, we're not dealing with the 1.4 times dead, we're dealing with the 1.2 times dead, which means we're no longer, we're no longer considering a massively underestimated or a massively underestimated dead load or a dead load massively beyond what we were uh, estimating in our design. Rather, what we're considering is more of a, uh, a higher than we expect dead load, but something that is still within the realm of, you know, still within the realm of reason. Uh, a 20% increase that is um, still, still would require some uh, unusual circumstance to happen, but not as incredible as a 40% increase in dead load. So, and uh, you always want to include some amount of safety on this. So, um, and in, in terms of dead load, we consider that as 20% 
um, in most of the uh, LRFD load combinations. Also note that that 1.2 times dead load, that 1.2 times D, uh, that factor appears in almost all, uh, well, I should say four of the seven that we're going to discuss, uh, in most of these load combinations. And the only time it appears to be 0.9 is for a few special load cases that we'll get to, but for uh, most cases, for the for four out of the seven, we use a 1.2 times D for our dead load. And again, what and, and so what you can kind of be thinking of in your mind is that this 1.2 times D, this basically represents the normal dead load. So if not, if we're not, unless we're designing for an extreme dead load case, our default normal level of dead load uh, when we're doing our structural design is going to be 1.2 times D. Again, it's not the uh, it's not one as you might think if you're just if you're talking about just um, uh, service level loads or something like that. There is still some margin of safety in there. We want to have we do want to have some margin of safety, but it is not a extreme event represented in the load case itself. Rather, the extreme event represented by this load case is live load. Live load has a factor of 1.6 applied to it. Again, look at all the other factors. Uh, we have um, we have dead load, we have live load, and we have either snow, wind, or uh, rain load, and none of them have a factor anywhere near 1.6. So really, what this particular load case represents is a massively uh, extreme live load event. So <laughs> so you have to consider a building a case where like a building is stuffed to the gills beyond capacity. So for example, if you know, you have some, if I was, if I'm going to use a university example, if you have a, if you have a, a lecture hall or something and, or a building with many lecture halls, and there is some incredibly popular speaker, um, some, someone of national acclaim, if Einstein rises from his grave and comes wandering into our uh, lecture hall tomorrow, and we're going to get a bunch of people in there and, um, and, uh, you know, stack the building to capacity. Um, now, uh, Point of note, and design engineers in the U.S. do not actually model the probability of Einstein rising from his grave. Um, that's neither, that's uh, not something, that's not really the level of rare event we're dealing with. But um, anyway, you're still talking in this case about a rare event that, uh, again, a rare live load event. So when your building is absolutely stuffed to the gills um, and, uh, we, and, and we end up having a live load far beyond what we estimate our building will experience. Now what's happening with this other with these other things? So again, we mentioned dead load. We have sort of our normal level of dead load, our extreme live load, and then we have this other term, the the snow, the rain, or the wind. And also we're not considering the full strength of them. We, we apply a 0.5 to these. Well, this again is based on is based kind of on the principle of concurrent probability. So if you have a, if you do have this extremely rare live load event, what are the odds that the biggest snow event, what are the biggest rain event, the biggest wind event are going to hit that building at the exact same time? Um, now, maybe if uh, Einstein rises from his grave in the middle of a hurricane, maybe in that case, we will actually have them uh, corresponded and he told everyone he was only going to be around for a couple of days. <laughs> maybe in that case, you'd have that kind of incredibly rare event. But rather what you might have is something like your, your rare live load event and then um, you have a rare live load event and then not the most extreme rainstorm the building will ever experience, but just a average rainstorm, a typical rainstorm or a typical windstorm or, or a modest winter snowstorm, not the blizzard of the century, not the, not the giant hurricane. Again, the odds of these extreme weather events happening at the same time as the building being stuffed to the stuffed to the gills is not likely to happen. And in fact, <laughs> the, these kind of large public events probably aren't going to happen. How are you actually going to get enough people to the building if there's a blizzard of the century going on anyway? I guess the only exception to that might be if that building was used, being used as an emergency storm shelter, but that's why there are very careful regulations and... Uh, very and actually very large importance factors applied to buildings that are going to be used as any kind of emergency shelter evacuation point etc so and that's one of the that's one of the purposes of the importance factor which we considered in a previous Note video also the critical or in this calculation it doesn't say apply half of our calculated wind load and half of our calculated snow load and half of our calculated rain load rather uh, we have to uh, check each of those at the same time. Oh, and it's not simply 
uh, pick one and go with whatever one is your favorite. No, it is uh, really this load combination represents three separate load combinations. I know it's kind of, uh, especially when you're learning this as a student, it seems, oh my God, we're getting piled on here. Um, but it really is three locations, load cases in one. You do have to actually combine, uh, you have to run each of these separately. Um, but they are just combined into one in our list here, just for the sake of brevity. Now, why is this or, not and? Um, for, and again, th that's the question I want to ask next. Like, why is this or here instead of and? Why not apply half the wind and half the rain and, and half the snow? Well, again, it comes down to the idea of concurrent events, concurrent probabilities. What is the uh, What are the odds that um, even a... Uh, now, okay, sure, maybe you accept that the most extreme wind event won't, won't occur at the same time as the live load event, but... Um, why not have multiple things applied? Why not have um, some rain while with some snow and some wind? Because often storms do generate both wind and um, rain and snow, or actually typically wind and snow or uh, the combination of rain and wind, but sometimes you get all three in a lovely wintry mix. Um, but anyway, so why don't we have uh, some combination where we're applying all of them simultaneously with this maximum live load? Well, it, it uh, is useful to realize that even 0.5 times your wind load is still a awful lot of wind. Wind uh, pressure does not, wind pressure and therefore forces do not scale linearly with velocity. They scale with the square of velocity. So you are dealing with quite an extreme event, even at 0.5 times your uh, predicted uh, wind force that you get from the relevant sections of AAC 7. So even 0.5, I mean, these are substantial events. Um, a 0.5 times your wind, that is going to be an event that you remember. It may not be the biggest hurricane in your lifetime, but it's going to be a substantial tropical storm or something like that. So these are significant events. So uh, the reason we apply or on these is that um, even though a storm does generate both wind and snow and may, may generate some combination of wind, snow, and rain, uh, 0.5 is still quite a large factor. If you were to use, if you wanted to apply all of them at once, you know, at the same time as the critical live load, uh, at, at the same time as, as that massive 1.6 times live load, you would probably want to use like a 0.2 or a 0.25 um, to each of those. And there are other load combinations, which we will now look at. Next, let's consider load case three. What do we have here? So we have a relatively uh, normal level of dead load, essentially, again, what we expect our structure to experience, plus a little bit extra, you know, 1.2 times uh, for some margin there. Then we have our core, uh, our core design element, or our largest factor, or essentially, this is what we're really designing for in this load case, either a uh, roof live load, snow load, or rain load. We're applying a very large factor, 1.6 times uh, each one of these, considered separately, of course, and then plus some live load or plus some wind load. Now, this, of course, is a, uh, again, one of those cases where you're not simply allowed to choose your favorite. You have to apply, uh, when it says or, it really means all. Uh, well, all of them applied separately. So in other words, uh, this one load combination essentially represents six separate load combinations because you have to run uh, the case with uh, roof live load with uh, the live load. Uh, you have to run the case with the roof live load with the wind load, um, snow load with the live load, snow load with the wind load, uh, rain with the live load, and rain with the wind load. Again, uh, multiple load combinations represented as one for the sake of brevity. But again, let's look at what this represents. Here we have an extreme, uh, some sort of extreme event being modeled as sort of our, I sort of think of this as our critical event that this load case is meant to experience. And this represents a uh, our uh, roof live load, for example, which is again, um, the kind of load that it's experienced as a building is experiencing maintenance work or uh, uh, re-roofing, that sort of thing, installing rooftop equipment, whatever it might be, times a very large, very conservative factor of safety. So again, um, this, if we looked at that just by itself, like let's consider, let's look at just one of those combinations. 1.2 dead plus 1.6 times live. Um, and let's just say plus 1.0 times L. 
a service level live load. So um, again, this is just one part, one of six case, sub cases that you have, would have to check as you're working through load combination number three. So what this represents is basically a, a service level plus a little margin level of dead load, a service, maybe I could write a service level of live load without any uh, amplification whatsoever, and then a strong design level, heavily factored uh, uh, roof live load. Uh, so design here. So again, we're looking at basically what well, this, so let's ignore it, break down the numbers, get past the numbers a little bit and think about what this represents. What scenario in the real world in an actual building does this represent? This represents a little bit more dead load than we're expecting right on the money for what kind of live load we're expecting and way more um, uh, rain load, uh, that, or sorry, roof live load than we are expecting. Uh, the rain load will be, of course, if you have an R here and the S for snow load. So if, and we could write this again, um, we could say the same thing for, if I substitute S in here for LR, we would be looking at a, essentially a normal level of, or a service level of both dead and, li and uh, live load. Uh, but then with a greatly uh, magnified, a massively magnified, a very conservative uh, value on our snow load and the same with our rain load. So the various versions of this load combination essentially represent various scenarios that the building might experience in its design life. Or let's say we had, let's look at the case of the 0.5 times wind. So let's look, so I always love, or I always find it useful to break this down and then in your head, imagine what this actually looks like in a structure in the real world. You pass the build, you pass the structural theory for a moment, uh, get past the calculations, look at what this actually represents for a real building in the real world. So let's look at the sub case of 1.2 times dead, 1.2 times D, uh, and let's just do, oh, I don't know, roof lab load again, 1.6 times LR, plus let's say 0 0.5 times W. So we essentially have a service level dead load with some, um, a little bit of magnification for some, for the sake of um, being conservative. We have our uh, roof live load, again, massively magnified, 60% uh, greater than what we're, deter what we're estimating uh, by, the by the provisions in ASC 7. And then we have half of the wind load. And again, that represents, so this essentially represents about as much dead load as, as we're expecting. Um, way more uh, uh, loading on the roof from construction, from building materials, ex uh, from uh, equipment that's moving around, that sort of thing. And then a significant but not storm of the century type wind event. So we're having 50% uh, of the type of massive, uh, of the largest window that we're designing our structure for. So it's still a significant event, but again, not the, not the storm of the century. So what happened, what you're talking about here is like, what comes to mind for me is I have an office building, for example, I, I might have an office building and, um, there is a, uh, we're re-roofing the building. There's a, maybe there's some extra, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of asphalting materials spread out, out all over the roof, uh, um, cause they've been delivered, but they haven't removed the old, maybe they haven't removed the old roof materials yet, but they have started stacking up a bunch of, um, new roofing materials. And so there is just a ton of material up there. There's a bunch of tools up there. There's safety equipment, there's safety harnesses and lifts and all sorts of things that go into uh, roofing a building. And so all that's up there. And then unfortunately, right in the middle of that, a pretty substantial storm rolls through. Now the workers probably aren't up there during this uh, pretty big storm event, but maybe they don't have time to bring down all their equipment and they probably certainly don't have the time to move all of their large uh, stored materials from the roof down to the ground. And they might not even want to if they could. And so um, you have a relatively large event, not again, not the storm of the century, which the 1.0 wind would represent at the same time that you were at a critical roof live load, again, where you had a whole bunch of material stacked on the roof, a whole bunch of tools and equipment. So notice what we're doing. We're we, uh, we, are, we are considering multiple kinds of load applied at once, but we're not applying the worst case of all of them. 
because again, what are the odds that right as they're uh, right as the uh, uh, roofing process is already massively overloaded and m way more than we're estimating, and right at that more moment, the storm of the century, a uh, Hurricane Ida, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Rita, whatever it might be, right at that moment, the giant hurricane rolls through. I mean, it could happen. But again, we have to design our level. We cannot limit, uh, you can never eliminate risk entirely. You can never achieve 100% safety in any real structure. And we have to, we have to instead accept some risk in our buildings and design them for some uh, predetermined level of risk. And so uh, as we work through these combinations, we see that each of them essentially represents a certain kind of scenario. This particular sub combination, again, represents sort of normal dead load with a massive amount of wind, a uh, massive amount of roof live load with a moderate amount of wind load. Now let us consider load combination four. 1.2 times D plus 1.0 times W plus 0.5 LR or S or R. So really what this represents, this really is the storm of the century. or at the very least, the windstorm of the century. So this represents a massive wind load. Now, you may wonder why we have a 1.0 for our extreme wind event, extreme wind, uh, windstorm of the century, and we will get to that in just a bit. But for now, just accept that this represents the case where you have a massive amount of wind load. Um, so we're dealing with essentially our uh, regular dead load. We have a massive amount of wind load, uh, even though even though the factor is only 1.0, you will note that in these combinations, that is the largest factor that we see applied um, to any LRFD wind load. And there is a reason for that, which we'll be looking at in a bit. And then um, and then in conjunction with that, we have not a not just a massive, a massively conservative amount of either of these, but just some amount of uh, roof live load, a moderate amount of roof, of roof live load, or a moderate amount of snow load, or a moderate amount of rain load. So this would represent the storm, the windstorm of the century, uh, appearing at the same time that um, maybe a, a moderate amount of roofing is going on, or or that storm, windstorm of the century is also accompanied by some snow load or some rain load, but not the biggest snow load or rain load that this structure is ever going to experience. So again, you can kind of, just by looking at the uh, factors that appear on the load combination, you can start to gain an appreciation for what this actually represents. Next, we have a very interesting one. This is ASC uh, 716 LRFG load combination number five. And this, again, is a really interesting one. We have 0 0.9 times dead plus 1.0 times W. And at first, at first glance, this seems to be just a subcase of the one above. I mean, why is this one present? Why not just, wouldn't it be, because uh, the, the fact, because the uh, previous uh, load factor, or lo I should say the previous load case we looked at had 0 0.1 times dead plus 1.0 times wind plus your other roof lab load, snow load, etc. But, so what's going on here? Why for number uh, five, why does number five exist at all? Wouldn't number four have someone be taking care of that? Well, I like this one because it's kind of counterintuitive. And the reason for this exists, um, the reason that this exists is because of the particular way that wind can act on structures. If you have a building, now this type of loading from wind is fairly intuitive. If you have a load being applied to a building, um, it can tend, it will tend, if you like the wind is, let's say the wind is going this way, the, uh, the primary force will of course be acting, um, there of course will be a large amount of force applied to this wall of the building acting in this direction. And that makes sense. However, and there's also some forces on the back end, but I'll leave that uh, aside for now. But one interesting thing that can happen is that very frequently, or perhaps even typically, you will get uh, what is known as wind uplift. Ah, think about this. Wind uplift. Wind will tend to generate an upward force on many roofing types, flat roofs and 
uh, certain show, uh, slope trees, etc. Of course, wind design is a devilishly detailed and complex uh, thing, um, and we'll be looking at that a bit later in the term in some supplemental videos. But um, for now, just realize that wind load generates forces on structures in uh, even if a wind even if wind is blowing hor entirely horizontally, which it need not do, even if wind is blowing entirely horizontally, it can still generate uplift forces on structures. You may have seen, uh, you actually may have seen video of this where a, say in a hurricane or a tornado, a big wind event comes along and it might just, in, if the if the structure isn't designed properly or if the, uh, I shouldn't say if it's not designed properly, if, or in some cases, if the, uh, the giant F5 tornado rolls in, which you often just simply can't design structures for, uh, especially a wood frame structures. But if a extreme event comes in and um, oftentimes what will happen in some cases is that the roof of the entire roof of the building will simply lift off of the structure uh, because of uh, wind uplift forces. Uh, horizontal wind can generate uplift on a roof. And we, we, can, get, we can talk about that more later in this course. But the uh, the importance of this is to is to consider what direction it's acting in. It is, uh, as the name would imply, it is acting upward. And notice, um, and and so let's think about this. Uh, let's think about this dead load. How is dead load acting? Dead load is going to act opposite to our wind uplift force. And the larger the dead load is, um, the more of our and so these are these are basically countering each other out. So wind load uh, or wind uplift is trying to pull the roof of a structure up while the dead load is trying to pull it down. They are acting in an opposition. And uh, the structure is already going to be designed to carry the full dead load. So it's not like dead load is going to suddenly pull twice as much as it was before. So during that storm event, during a heavy storm, during that extreme storm event, um, the dead load actually helps your uh, wind uplift case. Uh, so when you're designing the structure for wind, uh, for roof uplift, the dead load actually helps you. And thus, to be conservative isn't to use the one, if, thus if we use our standard 1.2 times dead load, we are, our uh, normally conservative uh, load factor is actually helping us rather than penalizing us, which isn't good. The whole point of having factors is to, uh, is to, re is to effectively increase the amount of load we're applying and effectively decrease our uh, resistance that we're calculating. And so if we use a factor of 1.2 in a case like this, where it's where that load is acting opposite to the load that we're really designing for, which is wind uplift, uh, that 1.2, instead of being conservative, will actually being uh, will actually be um, acting recklessly. It'll be it'll be helping us rather than penalizing us. So for this particular case, they require you to use a 0 0.9 times dead, not a 1.2, but a 0 0.9 times dead load. And that way, you're not subtracting as much. You're not eliminating as much of your wind uplift. You're not canceling out as much of your roof uplift that you would if you just if you use the 1.2, or even if you just used a service level factor of 1.0. Um, again, uh, you see these factors of less than 0.9 often when you have some forces acting opposite gravity. If there's any case where gravity would help you, you may have a factor of less than one applied to your dead load. Next, we have load combination six. This is essentially our first big seismic case. This is 1.2 times dead plus uh, 1.0 times EV, which is the vertical earthquake load in a building, plus 1.0 times EH, which is the horizontal earthquake loading on a building, plus just a service level 1.0 times live load, uh, plus 0 0.2, that's not 0 0.25, that's 0 0.2 times S, 0 0.25 times our snow load. So essentially what this case represents is your design earthquake case. We have a large, and seismic loading is always, our oh, seismic loads are, tend to be very large, well, depending where you're designing, but they are the, tend, the kind of thing that tends to control or dominate uh, designs in seismic regions. Um, usually it's not just a minor inconvenience. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this case rep really represents the seismic critical case. So we have a, uh, we're not dealing with the most, ex so we have our sort of normal level of dead load, 
that same 1.2 that we see at various points, just our uh, best calculated, best estimated dead load, plus some small amount for some small margin of safety. Uh, we have live load, which would actually correspond to a service level uh, live load or a very uh, sort of your typical everyday level of live load that you would estimate. And then a very small amount of snow load, literally just 0.2 or 20% of your snow load. So a very moderate snow load uh, that you might uh, experience. Now, um, again, this represents um, your, your seismic critical case. And notice again that even though this is really the seismic critical case, this is the load case where we're really considering uh, earthquake forces to control the design. Or it's the scenario where, and, and so this is the scenario where you're really considering the most extreme earthquake that you're designing for. This is not the storm of the century, this is the earthquake of the century. But note, we have a factor of 1.0 on here. Huh, that's kind of interesting. Why do we use 1.0 on there? Well, uh, that's something we'll get at in a bit when we look at sort of the history of the code a bit and look at LRFD versus ASD load determinations. Finally, we have load combination number seven, 0 0.9 times the dead load minus the vertical earthquake loading plus the horizontal uh, or lateral uh, earthquake loading. So what's going on here again? Why we see, and here we see the same kind of reduced dead load and uh, well, this time we have the live load, or sorry, the seismic load subtracted. Well, just like with the previous case of roof uplift, in this case, we're considering um, earthquake acting in the opposite direction of gravity. See, when you have a building, like so, and the, gr the, uh, the ground moves and that causes seismic forces, well, really what happens is the ground moves like this and the building's center of mass is still here and it, it's sort of getting tugged along, it's getting tugged back and forth and really that's what's generating your seismic loadings. But earthquakes, as the EV term probably uh, hints at, also generates vertical forces. However, look at this. Uh, vertical forces for um, seismic, just like lateral, if you've ever been in an earthquake, you'll know that the uh, buildings, if you're in a building, uh, you'll feel the building kind of rock back and forth, you know, very gently if it's a, you know, if, you, if it's a very modest earthquake, if it's, uh, well, there's actually earthquakes going on all the time that, um, and if you have a sensitive enough detector, you can detect earthquakes virtually anywhere, anytime. But in terms of things that we can actually detect, right at the threshold of human feeling, you will, um, if you're, if a, if a earthquake is occurring that is substantial enough where you are at your location in your building to generate, uh, to generate forces you can actually feel that are very soft, at the low end, again, they, you will just experience the building just gently rocking back and forth. But, and, but as the earthquake gets stronger, those vibrations get larger and larger and more and more forceful. But um, the key thing for this discussion is that they are acting, they don't just go, they don't just move one way. They don't just go, they also go, they are two-way forces. They are two-way motions. And so, and that the same thing, and so that that is easy enough to think about in the horizontal direction, but the same thing happens in the vertical direction. Seismic forces propagate via waves, and all waves experience back and forth motion. And I don't want to get too much into seismic theory here, but there are a variety of, there's more than one type of seismic wave, and, um, and, uh, because of the, the way with which uh, seismic forces and energies transfer through the, through the crust of the earth, uh, earthquakes are able to generate both vertical and horizontal motion. And each of these occur in a kind of sinusoidal, well, not truly sinusoidal, but they, they at least occur in a, um, in a bi-directional fashion. So um, if, a, if a building is going to can experience downward vertical force, it can also experience upward vertical force. And in this case, if our earthquake forces are acting opposite to gravity, just like the case with roof live load, if you have the case where your earthquake forces are going upward, actually upward, not just vertical, but actually upward, in that case, our dead load is actually helping us. So what we wanna to do to be conservative is take a 0 0.9 factor on that. So, we, so we're not taking advantage of as much dead load as we would if we used even just a service level case.
we don't want now we don't want to be crazy we don't want to use like a we don't want to use like a 0 0.3 times dead because um uh the the the, uh, the probability that your building somehow magically only has a mass or only uh only weighs 30 percent of what you're estimating that just really isn't feasible so your weight is probably going to be pretty close to what you estimate in your design, but we require a, a, but we're required to take some minor penalty um, just to make sure, and definitely not using our regular case of 1.2 times d. And actually, when you figure out going, when you figure going from 1.2 times d to 0 0.9 times d, that is a substantial reduction. That is a substantial reduction when you're talking about something that actually helps you rather than harms you. So again, this is a vertical case. <laughs> this is really designed for a vertical case where the earthquake forces are acting opposite to our dead load. So in turn, we want to reduce our dead load so we're not benefiting from our dead load um, uh, when we're dealing with uh, seismic forces acting opposite to gravity. Now, let us con next consider the ASC 716 uh, ASD, the Allowable Stress Design Load Combinations. Now, I don't want to go through each and every one of these, but you can see that the same kind of uh, general approach applies in some of our scenarios, in some of, or in some of our combinations. Uh, certain loadings are emphasized, whether that's live load or roof live load or wind load or seismic load, etc. And they consider different combinations of, or with your extreme event, you tend to have, a, say, a normal level of dead load or a normal level of live load. Well, actually, always a normal level of dead load unless it's acting, unless you're talking about one of those weird reverse cases where you have a force acting opposite of gravity. But um, anyway, the uh, in, uh, in each of these cases, you tend to have some critical loading, which is gen generally going to be the one with the largest factor, plus smaller factors that represent more moderate amounts of various loading. Now, I don't, again, I don't want to go over all of them, but there are some things I'd like to look at in the next section. Let us contrast the uh, first load combination for both ASD and LRFD. Uh, both of these represent the uh, dead load combination. However, you can notice that there are some differences. Well, the most, well, the only and most important difference is that here we have a dead load of 1.0 and here we have a dead load of 1.4. This really represents, uh, this, con this contrast really represents uh, the traditional difference. Uh, ASD versus LRFD difference. In other words, in the, L in the ASD case, in the ASD case, we are not applying any factor at all. We're simply using whatever dead load appears in, um, is going to be calculated by our best estimates and according to the provisions of ASC 7. And we just uh, apply a factor of, we'll, we'll basically end up applying a factor of safety later on uh, after you have calculated this. The, the, the load combination will have some, when you're doing your later design, you will apply a factor of safety at some point down the road. But um, you're not actually magnifying the load at all. You are simply just straight up using the service level loads, you're not adjusting things at all. And then in the LRFG case, you are applying a relatively large factor. You are taking that service level load and magnifying it. So again, I think the, the load combinations one in some case and two, except for the components that include things like uh, the ore, the snow, rind, uh, the snow, rain, etc. These really represent the uh, the purest contrast between ASD and LRFD, at least in terms of the historical design philosophies. Or consider these two environmental load cases here. Uh, both of these are ASD load combinations, so both of them are intended for uh, use with allowable stress design, both from ASC 716. We have load combination 5, which is D plus 0.6W, or a service level dead load plus 60% of our uh, wind load. And then we have ASC uh, 716, ASD load combination number eight, uh, a service level dead load plus 0.7 times the earthquake load in the vertical direction and 0.7 times the earthquake load in the horizontal direction. Huh. This seems odd. At least, I mean, think about this. Um, if you look through that list of load combinations, the ASD load combinations, 
these are not reduced in the sense that they're just a case. It's not, it's not like we're dealing with a case of a moderate earthquake here. This 0.7 on the earthquake is the largest factor you will ever see in the ASD um, basic load combinations uh, for seismic load. It doesn't get larger than 0.7. This is not, there is not a case, a load case where there's a 1.0 or 1.5 or 1.6 or 1.4. You know, there's no 1.4 EV or 1.2 EV anywhere in these combinations. There's a, only a reduced earthquake load. What's going on here? Um, and look at the wind. Again, this is not a minor wind event. This is not a case where we have, you know, a bunch of other things applied and um, a bunch of other things applied and... Uh, we're talking about maybe like a moderate wind event in conjunction with a large live load or a large roof live load. No, this 0.6 really is the storm of the century. Um, so when we're designing an ASD for the storm of the century, we're using a factor of, one point, or of 0 0.6. This, again, look through the list of factors and look through all the list of uh, ASD load combinations. This 0.6 is the largest um, factor you ever see applied to any uh, wind load. So what is going on here? This doesn't seem to make any sense. Shouldn't we have some sort of like 1.2 times W or 1.5 times W? But no, all we have is the 0 0.6 times W. What's going on here? And um, also, you may recall back when we looked at uh, a oh, back when we looked at L or FD, I'll write this in a different color for uh, clarity or hopeful clarity. We'll see. Clear as mud. In LRFD, we had factors of not 0.6 and 0.7, but both of these had factors of 1.0, not in these exact numbered load cases, but in the most critical. The largest factors we ever saw on, say, like a vertical or a horizontal uh, seismic load or on a wind load was 1.0. Hmm. And again, okay, and if you're having trouble appreciating why this at first sounds so, why this should sound so ridiculous, is think back to the basic definition of AR ASD versus LRFD. Um, any elementary structures text will tell you that the basic difference between ASD and LRFD is that LR, that AS, aside from using stress versus force for design, that's another thing entirely, another discussion entirely, but in terms of risk management, um, traditionally, ASD uses service level loads and LRFD uses load combinations. So what is going on here? So again, what is going on here? Again, with our ASD load combinations, we are using for our wind and our seismic, we are using factors that are less than one. Well, for our LRFD, we're using factors just equal to one. Well, really what, it, what this represents is sort of history or at least or history and process or a transition period in the history of um, the design codes of, uh, of a or specifically of ASC 7. So if you were to open up ASC 7, um, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago or whatever it might be, if you were to open up a much older edition of, of ASC 7, you actually would see load combinations for ASD that were simply something like uh, dead load, uh, dead load plus live load, um, you know, dead load plus wind plus some factor on different things, uh, you know, 0 0.25 times roof live load or whatever you might have. And so there was a time when you would never see a fact, when, actually I probably shouldn't include that, 0 0.25 on roof live load. There was a time when the sort of textbook definition of um, ASD design being, or ASD uh load combinations being purely service level um, and LRFD being the only ones with uh, uh, complex load combinations with multiple factors, there was a time when that distinction really held true. But as we as time has moved on, uh, if you want to know a bit about LRFD philosophy, at least the history of it, it started out really in the, in, uh, the reinforced concrete field. Um, it was used as a method of uh, taking into account the, uh, it was really first in that field because a lot of the research that was done there, especially in terms of the uh, variability, the concrete has innately high variability in strength and properties than 
you'll experience than say steel design. And so it traditionally, um, it, so it was really the first area of, uh, a first area within civil engineering where, uh, where you started to see uh, uh, LRFD philosophy applied, for example, in the ACI provisions. But as time has gone on, it has become um, more and more popular, more and more common, to the point where now it really is the standard rather than the exception. There are still some, some areas and some practices that use ASD, but the world is slowly, you know, take, it's like anything, um, especially think about the field of construction and civil and engineering and structural engineering. The fields of construction and building design, these fields are in terms of disciplines, these fields move slowly. They transition over, you know, entire lifetimes. There are people who, um, you know, if, uh, uh, who start a career using one thing and they want to stick with that their entire career for good or for ill. And I have had, you know, I've seen lively debates uh, on, with good arguments being on both sides. Um, the You will rarely see people say that LRFD is unsafe, um, but sometimes you'll see uh, that you'll see people say that it's just not worth it or it's overly complex and then it, or maybe it doesn't produce the benefits that it promises. But there's a lot of lively debate, but still. Um, one way or another, the world seems to be going um, largely toward LRFD design, and that really is reflected in how, or that really has been reflected in how uh, ASC 7 has moved to the point that um, that will really begin to explain what is going on here with these factors. You see, um, when you see a factor greater than 1.0 in um, uh, when you see a factor in the LRFT provisions or in LRFT load combinations, if I can manage to spell LRFT collect correctly, oh my goodness, <laughs> LRFT. In LRFT, if you see a factor or if the if the largest factor that a uh, type of loading, like live load, snow load, dead load, whatever it might be, if the largest factor is greater than uh, 1.0, then that factor is calculated at service levels. However, if the largest factor in um, LRFD, if the largest factor is less than one, uh, or actually I should say is equal to one, then these loads are already calculated at LRFD levels. They are already calculated at LRFD levels. In other words, if you look at these, um, we have actually changed how we calculate, not not completely change the entire method, but change the uh, reference values, the base values used in determining, for example, wind and seismic loading. Um, and we've changed them in such a way that they already include a greater than one factor. So um, the way the code is moving, instead of having separate uh, factors for LRFD, uh, for a, um, for the different load combinations in LRFD. Instead, many of them are just adopt, just in applying those factors, those, those large case, those critical largest case factors um, to the load calculations themselves. So um, when you're, ca so if you look up, so now these are kind of baked into the methods of ASC 7. So at some point, way in the distant past, when you ran through the calculations, uh, all the provisions to calculate wind load, you would calculate it with the numbers you would get would represent your would truly represent say for example if you're aiming for a two percent probability that would represent a two percent probability of exceedance in a given year that would literally represent like if you are aiming for a two percent level of safety then the forces you get by just applying the calculations in asc7 would directly map to what you would experience in that two percent event however in um, as we've ch as we move more in the direction of LRFD, we have actually changed the provisions for calculating these uh, wind and earthquake loading to the point where they already include some increase or some. They basically already have the load factors baked in, and so 
um, because of that, we know on the on the basic load combinations, we no longer need to use a load factor um, when doing LRFD design when using when looking at the most critical cases for wind and seismic. Instead, if we actually want to go back, because again, the values you get in the seismic and wind chapters already have a load factor baked in. And so you don't need to reapply it twice when doing LRFD. However, if you want to go to ASD, where you're supposed to get, where you're supposed to be doing everything with service level loads, in that case, you will have to actually decrease them and remove that kind of um, load factor that has been applied to them. And so, if you want to get, for, uh, if you want to get an idea of the rough um, level of um, of the rough level of what this factor would have been, you can simply take the inverse of these, one over 0.6, one over 0.7 etc. So we have moved. Uh, so again, you will learn academically and you'll see in an elementary structures text that the um, that the basic difference between LRFD and ASD is that LRFD uses um, load factors and ASD simply uses allowable stress. Um, uh, again, using service level loads. Um, and that is the sort of textbook definition. But in actual design codes, what's gradually happening is that the loads have uh, been slowly moving to be calculated using service, or sorry, using uh, factored loads, factored design loads, uh, rather than using the, the actual service level, what we actually expect the structure to experience for a given return period. And this is not something that has happened overnight. This has taken many years. Uh, code changes happen very slowly. They're built over a, you know, years and years and years long process of slow, gradual community consensus building. Um, it's, it's it's a really complicated process involving lots of committees and experts and that sort of thing. Um, but it is a slow, gradual process that's built up through consensus. And so uh, things tend to move one chunk at a time when moving from LRFD to ASD calculation. So for example, um, wind and seismic, those have moved toward the direction of LRFD scale calculations. However, there are some things like if you, again, um, looking at this rule that we talked about that we mentioned right here, if a factor is greater than one, it probably means if, if, if a factor greater than one appears anywhere in the LRFG combinations, it means that factor is, it means that uh, load case or that type of load is probably determined at service levels. So when you see 1.6 times L, that means the live loads that we're calculating in, in our live load chapters or in our live load chapter and provisions, those are calculated without any kind of factor of safety applied. These are the, um, these are exactly what we predict would be applied to a building based on a given return period, a given probability of exceedance, that sort of thing. So <laughs> this is where things get a little screwy. We have, um, again, even though the traditional definition of LRFD and, AR and ASD suggests that all the factors should be one and everything in ASD should be service level and off and we should be applying factors only in the LRFD case. As times moved on, things have kind of turned on their head a bit and we are now applying factors to, uh, we're now applying factors to reduce the wind and seismic loads um, that are determined at, AS, at LRFD levels. Or again, maybe uh, maybe if I want to just boil this down and simplify this a bit, uh, for example, if wind and seismic, uh, E and W, these are already at LRFG levels. And that's why they don't have a factor of 1.0. And then, so if you want to use them in ASD, you need to reduce them. And that explains why you have these weird factors, even though textbook definitions of LRFD versus ASD would uh, intuit that you would have factors of 1.0 on all of the service level loads. Gradually, I suppose if you were to, I don't know when this process will be finished, but I imagine at some point in the future, uh, probably all of the loads in ASC 7 will be calculated at an LRFD value. And so maybe the, so probably the largest factor you'll see on any LRFD load will be uh, 1.0 and then um, with smaller ones meant to uh, represent less extreme events. And then ASD would be just, will be just chocked full of uh, load factors less than one. And so our traditional definitions break down a bit, but again, it all comes to, so 
In short, it comes down to the, really the history of how we moved from uh, uh, from how we have moved from uh, ASD to LRFP provisions, and how a lot of the so, and how the factors of safety that, according to textbook definitions, would be applied as load factors, are actually baked right in to the wind and seismic calculation process. And finally, I couldn't conclude a discussion of ASD versus LRFD load combinations without mention of this lovely gem, uh, this lovely term found in the uh, ASD load combination six. Uh, again, this isn't the whole load combination. This is just one part of it relating to the wind calculation. But I love this. You have not one, but two factors applied. And what does this represent? Well, again, we're applying a factor of 0.6 on the wind to reduce it reduce from LRFD to ASD levels. And then you have another factor. And this factor essentially just uh, is meant to consider the non-extreme event. So in this particular uh, case, this load combination, we are not considering a, you know, the storm of the century. You're considering slightly less than the storm of the century. You're talking about uh, not the biggest hurricane you'll ever experience, but a pretty decent windstorm. So uh, consider non-extreme case. We're reducing it twice. Once to bring the, the wind load. Again, wind load is calculated at LRFD level, not ASD level. So we have to, if we're doing an ASD load combination, we first have to reduce it by 40% to reduce from LRFD to ASD. And then uh, because this isn't the critical wind case uh, load combination, we have to reduce it a second time uh, to take into account the, uh, to consider the uh, less critical scenario that we're modeling with this load combination. And I just love it. Uh, it makes sense when you break it down. And the reason it's listed as two different factors is instead of just one multiplied together factor is precisely so you can see where it comes from and realize that it's um, some amount of reduction to surface level plus some reduction for a non-extreme event. But I just love it because you have these two factors and it just looks wonderfully absurd. But uh, anyway, it serves a purpose. It's there for a reason. Um, you can still design uh, structures using ASD or LRFD, um, but uh, ASC, uh, ASC 7 certainly isn't making it any easier to remain at the, in the ASD methods, um, especially because we now have to apply load combinations in ASD that are just as complicated for LRF as you do in LRFD. So, um, anyway, the traditional textbook definition uh, seems to be breaking down a bit, <laughs> but it still makes sense uh, from a from a um, from a more expanded point of view. And to conclude, here again are our load combinations uh, in both LRFD and ASD. A few key takeaways of this lecture: uh, first, remember the ultimate purpose that load combinations are meant to do or are meant to serve. Their each load combination is meant to consider various scenarios or various uh, various scenarios representing various combinations of loads, which ultimately represent versus various critical events that a building may experience in its lifetime. So you may have a case of massively uh, over-designed dead load. You may end up with a case with a uh, massive live load event, a massive wind event, etc. And there are some accompanying loads applied related to what type of loads may uh, may be experienced, what more what may be reasonably experienced, such as a 50% well, uh, or reduced uh, s uh, snow load at the time of the critical wind load, perhaps earthquake load, etc. Um, so key takeaways are that these ultimately represent possible scenarios that a building might experience. Um, and that, uh, so that's one of our first key takeaways. And further, another key takeaway is that um, originally all loads were going to be calculated in ASD um, in certain terms of, uh, we're going to be calculated at the service level, the ASD service level. And then um, as times move on, however, the traditional textbook definition of LRFD being the only place where load factors apply has tended to break down as we've started to move in the direction of applying uh, the load factors in the load calculation process rather than in the LRFD uh, load combination process, calculation process itself. So uh, right now, uh, seismic load and wind load are calculated at the uh, LRFD level and the others are calculated at a, um, at a uh, ASD level, the traditional service level. Um, but as time moves on, uh, we'll gradually see more and more of these.
uh, represented um, at the LRFD, or when I say represented, I mean calculated directly at the LRFD rather than the ASD level. All right, I think that'll do it for today. That was just my brief coverage. Well, <laughs> brief indeed. Uh, my coverage of uh, LRFD versus ASD, specifically looking at the ASD 716 uh, load combinations. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, and I hope you found this enjoyable. I hope you found this a little bit interesting or illuminating if this is what you're studying. Um, let's see what else. Again, L we've looked at a we've looked at LRD versus ASD. We've looked at service level loads versus design level loads. Uh, and we've learned a bit about the history of the uh, transition from ASD to LRFD design. Hope you, again, I hope you found this enjoyable and I look forward to seeing y'all soon. And as always, thank you.